Yeah, hi. So, yeah, thanks for staying back. Um, because we definitely want to have a conversation here, an interactive conversation with you. Um, keen to hear a lot about what, you know, the content and what you've seen. Um, but before we get to you as an audience, I'd like to s introduce the panel members. Um, to my far right, it's Nadine Marsh Edwards. She's um, producer um, mainly, but she's also executive, executive produced films and, and so on, but she's mainly a producer at Greenacre Films. And she's, um, her work spanned, uh, spans uh, three or four decades um, in terms of the black cinema and black um, filmmaking. We want to start with her really and have a conversation about her work and um, it informing what we know as the um, black British um, cinema canon. Um, next to her is Nellie Alston. She, um, she is the uh, founder of a collection, a collective rather, um, called Tape. Um, I'll allow her to tell you a little bit about that. And um, then we have Isis Thompson, and she's the director of the film. Um, this film is meant to be called. This film is meant to be about Stokely Carmichael. Stokely Carmichael. Catchy. Catchy. <laughs> <laughs> and then next to me is Raina Campbell, and she's the director of um, Laps of Honor. Um, and of course, my film was also included, um, titled Regents and Vicky. Um, so, okay, let's start with. The title of this panel, which is um, this, um, why we are more than black filmmakers. And in terms of the title and responding to the title, I want to talk about uh, the black British cinema canon. And um, with that, I want to discuss uh, Nadine's work her and her trajectory. Nadine, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the definition of black British cinema? Oh, I think that came about before my time, to be honest. Um, I was a student and very heavily influenced by the work of Menelik Shabazz and Horace Ove, who'd both made feature films before I even thought about making films, to be honest. And I think, um, just to go back a bit before that, I think maybe now, uh, we may think we're spoilt for choice with the number of films that we can see that have people of colour, different colours in them, let alone films made by black people. When I was growing up, you literally did not see any black people, Asian people, Chinese people. You didn't see anything. The only time you saw differences, there was a horrific programme on called Mind Your Language, and it was about a language school. So you had different foreigners going in. It was a comedy, by the way, believe it or not. And that's the only time you saw different types of people on TV. And for me, going to school the next day after that was awful because it meant in the school I was at, there were very few black people. And so you were basically taking the piss off for the whole of the next day because that's where you came from. So coming out of that and then deciding um, you wanted to get involved in film uh, was a really strange thing because when I, I went to Goldsmiths and I think my year was only the second year of there being a degree that was about film making, full stop. You know, it was the start of mass communications and film school. Um, so when I went there, there were a couple of other black students who were also studying, which I was amazed. And just to fast forward a little bit, we decided to set up a company together without actually understanding what a company was. Uh, we used to meet in McDonald's and there was myself, um, Maureen Blackwood and Martina Attil and Robert Cruz who's from Sri Lanka. And basically, we, I asked my tutor, who was William Rabin, I said, do you know of any other black 
students doing film in London. And he said, oh, actually, I do. One was Maureen, and I think she was here. And he said, oh, and there's this guy called Isaac Julian who's in St. Martin's. I went, oh, OK, uh, let's go meet him. So I went and met him. And it turned out I'd known him for years because we used to dance together at nightclubs, but we just never knew what each other did. And so we decided to... I don't know why. We, we just said, let's try and make some films. And I had already got a job as um, a trainee film editor because it was just when <coughs> Channel 4 had been going for a couple of years by then. And I was lucky enough to be able to be given... Um, we shot on film then, so the company that was making TV programmes gave us their short ends, and then we went off and we made a film called Territories with that. And so we did a lot of stuff for the first time, not quite knowing what we were doing, but what we knew was some of us were art students, some of us wanted to make main, more mainstream stories, but what we definitely knew we wanted to do was interrogate what it was like to be a young black person in this country at that time. And we were really fortunate that it coincided with Channel 4 coming into existence and having a remit to give money to different types of groups. Um, there was the workshop association that was set up then by the trade unions. So we were a collective, so we all worked, we all earned the same amount of money, we all had the same what we were making and there were a number of workshops up and down the country. And we just, we were just really lucky in many ways that we had a lot to say. We were really stupidly young and we just did it. And we didn't know we weren't meant to do it. And it meant that we produced a great amount of work in a very short period of time. And I think, one, the timing was good because of the politics at the time. And I, this may sound strange because the politics of the time was Maggie Thatcher, who most of us despised, you know, with a passion. But that kind of spurred us even more to say what we wanted to say. It was like, if we don't say it now, we may never get another chance to say it. So we just said everything we wanted to say. And um, there were also riots happening up and down the country where young black people were starting to say, you, police, you cannot treat us like this. And I think that also helped us to get money from authorities because our voices were being heard, not just one at a time, it was en masse. And that's where I think ourselves, Black Audio, Retake, Chedo, there were a number of black collectives set up at that time. And not only did we make work, but we helped other people make work as well. Okay, um, moving across, um, thanks, uh, it's Nelly. And do you want to speak a little bit about your um, collective and perhaps kind of respond to um, Nadine's uh, discussion about what was happening back then and in terms of struggles and challenges and what you think your collective is doing in that respect oh. about today? Um, so I'm one third of... Um a film collective called Tape Collective, um, which was set up by me and two of friends a few years back. We all met doing, I don't know if anyone knows, Barbican Young programmers. Um, so, yeah, I found out a few years ago about programming and this you know, concept of being able to put on what you're interested in and being able to see work that you can't come across in, you know, in regular cinemas or in day-to-day -day life. And... Um, yeah, just got more interest in that. But as you can imagine, it's a, as of all things in film, it's a very small pool of people who actually have the ability and are given the chance to do that in regular film spaces. And even within that, you could be into something that is considered more auteur or niche, but you're told that as a programmer, you can only screen, you know, Hollywood things that people will pay for. And I think the dialogue around that recently has been incredibly interesting and hopefully more and more progressive, it, but in such a way that seems crazy and so slow. You know, the fact that we are now all today really happy that Black Panther has been nominated for an Oscar, um, which is something that you wouldn't have in the dialogue maybe 10 years ago. Um, so when we all met, we just 
wanted to show films to people our own age group or anyone who was interested um, that we felt represented ourselves more and we couldn't find in the day to day. So our collective shows films that have had a very limited release, so maybe they're a rep screening but we think there's an interesting dialogue around it, or that they've been screening in festivals but otherwise wouldn't get distribution if people like us didn't show it. Um, and it's all about galvanising like further interest in film and hopefully inspiring other people in the community to do, do similar screenings. Like I'm aware that I live in my own bubble as much as everyone else and film is a great way of learning from one another. So we put on events at Bricks and Ritzy, um, we just had a screening as part of London Short Film Festival at the Manchester Cinema and we usually do some sort of event around it to talk about what's going on in our fe feelings and how that is portrayed in film. response to what you were saying um, I guess I spoke to that bit in distribution so my day job is um, I actually work in film distribution the programming collective is more of you know, like a freelance thing that I'm interested in um, but it means that I'm also really aware of how hard it is to or, or how, how few black filmmakers are actually getting their stuff on screen like I've worked with Manila Shabazz but um, in terms of when you're communicating with cinemas that you know you believe people will want to watch this movie, it's very hard to get to get a big slot. And even when it does, they will maybe program it at awkward times, or they say, "Oh, we can screen it here because we know that black people are here, but otherwise we're not going to put it on because other people aren't interested." And um, they might not necessarily they're not they're not necessarily saying that they think it's a bad film, but they'll just be like, "Oh, it won't work." Um, and I think by doing, you know, the stuff that Tape Collective are doing, but just, you know, the world in general by saying no, you know, we're human beings who can who can empathise and learn from one another just because someone doesn't look exactly like me doesn't mean I can't understand them. Or for that matter, you know, black filmmakers or other people of colour make up a huge part of the population. So this concept, as we're finding with things like Girls' Night, you know, um, won't result in money or won't create a quality product is ridiculous. Um, and so I've, I've been told as, when I first started in the industry that the chance to do something like that have actually lessened because places like Film 4 aren't, aren't, mm. take, aren't taking on those modes of film anymore. There's no money there in that traditional sense. Um, and yes, that there is that element to it. Um, but then the flip side is that you know, everyone has more films are being released now than ever before. People have more access to film. You can make some, you can make a relatively good quality mm. product on your phone if if you so mm. go about it. Mm. Um, so I think it's interesting, like where we are now in in terms of having that conversation, and just being able to get that output out there, and being able to galvanise the people you know in your community to sh to say no, this does work, and um, see where film goes from there. Okay, thanks. Um, right. So now then we are on to. Isis, please do t talk to us about where you are in terms of your trajectory. And as well, um, I'm sure the audience would like to hear more about the film. Um, I think, you know, everyone kind of was well received. So you perhaps want to talk about that film as well. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, my trajectory. Um, what am I doing now? So I'm making um, I, I'm making documentaries, but I am making lots of audio documentaries. Um, I'm working on an eight-part series for Audible at the moment, which will um, hopefully correct a lot of the things that I got wrong in the film um, about um, uh, sort of knowing your roots and so on. So that that's something that um, is happening as we speak. Um, and uh, the film was basically the reason that I made that film. It was kind of out of the frustration of knowing that at some point I was going to be expected to make a black film, like a film about my blackness and dealing and dealing with it, and having that sort of weight of sort of expectation um, when maybe I just wanted to make films about you know. I don't know, ice skaters, I don't know, anything. But um, 
but I never sort of fully felt that I had the right to make a film about anything. Um, so my attitude was, okay, I feel you wanting me to make a film about black stuff, and this is how I'm going to do it. It's going to be not the way that you want or expect. Um, and um, I was also very aware of the fact that, I mean, this film is nearly 10 years old, and, um, and I was just very aware of the fact that um, black women weren't allowed to be silly, um, and I wanted to make something that, that I was allowed to be silly in. Um, uh, and that felt really important to just like be like, this is my stuff. Um, some of it's real, some of it's not, but I'm gonna I'm gonna play with it and see and see how it feels. Um, so yeah, it was about it was about um, yeah, it was about sort of telling people, fine, have this, but it's gonna not be what you want. That was the the original. Raina, do you want to do the same? Talk about, because this Lapse of Honor is your first film, so it's a debut. Um, so perhaps talk about the process of, of getting there, essentially. And also, if you don't mind, to speak a bit about your career as an actress as well. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, Lapse of Honor started as a poem when I was at drama school. Um, I was having a tough time created this poem and then when I came back to the UK because I trained in New York I found it very difficult to get started as an actress in this country so I had the idea I'm going to write a play and be in the play and maybe I'll be discovered it didn't work but um, <laughs> I used the poem as a basis for um, the play and I toured the play in Manchester and London. Everyone that saw the play said, it's very filmic, you should turn it into a film. And I didn't really have any interest in doing that. But I did start writing scripts. That's something that I really enjoyed. And at the time, um, funding came from the UK Film Council. And I heard that you had a better chance of getting funding if you were from the region. So I was like, oh, well, I'm from Manchester. I'll just go up there, use my mum's address. And <laughs> so, um, and I met a, a lady there that was heading the Northwest. It, it was called Northwest Vision, and she was called Tara Cook. And she um, produces Downton Abbey and programs like that. And she had come across my script and she said, I think you should direct this script. And I said, I'm not a director, I'm an actress. I'm looking for someone to make this for me. And I really want to tell this story because it's based on a true story. And I feel like I can't move on until I've told this story. But she planted the seed in my head. And it got optioned to different producers. And every time it got optioned, they would sit on it for ages. And I'd be like, just make it. It's not that hard. Like, why is it taking so long? And then I got so frustrated, I decided I'm actually going to make this myself. So I'm going to raise the money and just make it. Um, I started off raising money on like Kickstarter. I didn't raise very much. And then I just shamelessly begged everybody for money. I was like, Whatever money I get, I'm going to make the film. So people were very kind. And then I got a big chunk of money from uh, a guy in Germany. And I just made the film, not in a typical film way, just how in my brain I thought it would happen. Even though I had been acting, I used some of the knowledge from what I'd observed on set. Um, and I bought this DVD series called How to Make a Film for $20,000, which was very entertaining. <laughs> but after I watched this series, I was like, I feel like I can literally make the film now. So we, I decided if I go back to Manchester, it will be cheap there because I know lots of people, I can get loads of favours. I rented a student house, and so that doubled up as the production office. 
the catering, the green room, makeup, and the set. And anyone who knew me did not escape. My friend was a midwife. I was like, <laughs> you are production manager. Even my grandma, <laughs> she was on kitchen duty. Like, nobody escaped. My mum was like, she just finished a shift. Um, she used to work in the hospital. And she came to check on me, and she ended up in, like, one of the funerals. So everyone came together and we made this film. I was doing some charity work with some of the kids in Manchester who were very interested in getting a foot in the door, but they had no way or means to get in. So I just used them. And because they didn't have any preconceptions, they were very natural when they were acting. And uh, Film London, when I finished it, I didn't know what to do, but Film London got behind it and... Um, they helped it get into some really great festivals. And I mean, this, I was just saying before, it's like when you create a film, it has a spirit of its own. So this film is a diva. So I was thinking when it's finished, I don't know if it's any good or, and it was like, talk to yourself. Um, I'm going to Cannes. <laughs> then I'm going to the Pan African Film Festival in Los Angeles. And it's still traveling even now, like next month it's going to Germany. And this, this film has been traveling and traveling and traveling. So I'm very proud of it. Um, and now I'm putting together my second feature film, which is completely different. It's a comedy and um, I'm really looking forward to making that. I can't remember what else you asked me. No, I think you've covered it. <laughs> but at this stage, I think I'll take some questions from the audience. Right, any questions? My name is June. My daughter's here, Stephanie. She's um, she's doing digital filmmaking at the moment. So I was wondering, did any of you go to university, um, well, or college, to do your films before you actually made them? And if you have any advice for sort of young black filmmakers, what would it be? I didn't go to you. <laughs> well, I did, but not to study filmmaking. I think just do it. I think this is a brilliant time to be a young filmmaker. I think the equipment is there. Things can be done really cheaply. And I think if you get a group of friends together, you can make stuff. But I think the main thing is, is to make sure you've got a good story that you want to tell. If you've got a good story, people aren't that bothered about how well it's lit or how well it's edited. People will become engaged with the story that you're telling them. But I think find some like-minded people and just go out and shoot. Yeah, I, I, I went to film school. Um, I, went, I, I actually went here for my undergrad. Um, uh, yeah, so I did film here and then I went to NFTS and I did film, uh, my master's. Um, but I would, I, yeah, I agree. Basically, there's there's like at, at the moment there's, there's no excuse. If you want to be making films, go and make a film. Like you've got a phone. Like you've got like you've got equipment. Like hopefully you've got friends. Like so like if you want to make something, you can coordinate these people and you can and you can just do it. Um, and of course, like uh, when you leave, you're going to need to work and you're going to need to eat and um, and obviously that has to take a priority. Um, but that only gets really tired when you're not making your own work as well. So just keep making, like whatever, whatever's going on in your life, just keep making. I didn't study film at university, but it's not that I didn't want to. I was just told by my family, by my teachers, everyone, that it was a waste of time, a waste of money. You'd never get a job in it anyway. So I, you know, did the sensible thing and took a history degree. Um, but. Afterwards, I came to this realisation that I just didn't want to resign myself to all the jobs that were being offered when I'm probably going to be working to the light well into my 80s. Mm. Um, so better to try now, you know, than never. And I spent a good sort of depressing four months applying for um, lots of unpaid internships that I still didn't necessarily get because 
it's quite an artistic in film, and you, you know, famously so, so you give it to the, you know, a friend of someone. Um, but I persevered, and I got a place on an internship, and got to, not an internship, sorry, a traineeship, and so therefore I got um, paid to, like, learn the job in different film companies. So, um, yeah, my advice would be to you that there's more than one way of going about it, look into apprenticeships, whatever. You know, like she said, the equipment is there, and that's a bit, because there are opportunities. Well, uh, mine's more of a process one, so um, I'll be quick. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of um, being so long getting onto Netflix, and, and Rena, you're, you're finding a producer um, who is so well established, the process of getting, um, and, and um, you mentioned about nepotism, how do you get past those gatekeepers and get to platforms where your work will be seen? My interest is more television. Um, and telling stories in that way. But um, I'm just curious as to how you guys got around the barriers of getting your stuff seen. Um, so, Tara Cook, she only advised me to direct the film, but I produced and wrote and directed it myself. Um, and then I presented it to Film London, and then they got behind me after that. How did you get to the I wrote it. I thought you You mean initially? Yeah. Oh, before? Because it was attached to a producer, and he had applied to her for funding. And she'd actually offered him funding for it, but he wanted it to make it for millions of pounds, and it was a low budget. So, um, I don't know if you guys mind, but I would like to talk a little bit more about the content and what of what we've just seen, and perhaps just kind of look at a kind of idea of the the issues that we're covering in the eighties when the black um, British cinema um, canon was being formed, and the issues we are covering now, and at the same time answer the question around whether documentaries, for example, is covering some of those issues today more than, say, fiction film, um, generally. Um, uh, can, um, Isis, do you want to start with the idea of documentaries and the issues that um, you've covered in your the films that you've made to date and where, and where you're going with that? Um, I kind of feel like every every piece that I make is a response to the last piece that I made. Um, uh, so the, pa the piece that I made directly after this was um, a piece that I made as part of a collective, which is one of the best things you could do as you leave as you're leaving university, um, um, about student activism. Um, and then the ne the piece after that. Um, was a reaction to that, and then and and right now I'm making a piece which is a reaction to this film, sort of nearly ten years on, um, looking at activism. Um, uh, yeah, legit, yeah, essentially you, looking you at. Because you made um, that the film. Because when I showed your first film, um, well, this not your first film, this film, um, Stoke, um, Stokey Carmichael film, and then you, at the time you were making a film about social network. Yeah. Yeah. What year was that? That was 2011. So we were still we were still at film school when we started making that, and it was all three of us. It was our first feature, um, and yeah, we were we were still students, and there and it was 2010, and the whole country, were, all the universities across the country, were in occupation against the um, tuition fee hikes, um, and. So we, we got in with the UCL occupation, who are one of the most active ones, and we stayed, we, we stayed with them um, and followed them for six months um, and raised along the way like 45 grand or so to, like, to finish the film. Um, so yeah, I kind of feel like um, 
some projects that you well, well most of my projects set, set me up for the next thing that I want that that I want to do. Like there, there feels like a clear line um, for where I want to go next. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, Nadine, um, mm. on the other hand, are you making films today that's sort of covering kind of heavy social issues? Mm. I think we are. I mean, I think, I think, but maybe we do it in a slightly different way. Um, when we made Been So Long, we, when we shot that uh, 18 months ago, um, we were advised to be very careful about images that were released. So the first image that went up on social media was a shot of um, Michaela and Arinze about to kiss, which we just thought was a really simple picture basically stating this is a love story. What we weren't prepared for was um, the response we got back. And uh, it was kind of encapsulated when we had a screening at the Genesis when we had a Carla who we've made a, a couple of experimental films with and documentaries. He came up and did a little pre-talk about the film. And he said when he saw the film, he said he thinks it's one of the most political films he's ever seen. And he backs that up by saying, um, when was the last time you saw a film made in... Britain that had two black people in a love story who stayed together. And that was backed up when we had quite a lot of discussions with audiences afterwards. And the response we got from young black women in particular was, thank you for making this film about us. Thank you for showing a film about different things that are possible because we never see this being shown. So I think you can be very political about something without it being about politics with a big P. Uh, and in a way, you know, I could go back to some of the films that I was involved in in the 80s and then the 90s and the 2000s. They are all about representation one way or another. But I've been fortunate enough to go from making short films to experimental films to feature films, then I worked in TV for seven years. And so now I've kind of got a foot in each camp and, you know, I get to make different things because I've had a foot in each camp. And, you know, I think a big part of it is making sure that financiers trust you with their money because there's a big difference from asking for £10,000 to make something to saying, can you give me a few million? Because once you start kicking up into those figures, they actually want their money back at some point. So what we were really, really pleased about was that when we did the deal with Netflix, which was not our original intention, our original intention was for it to be seen in cinemas, part of the reason we said yes to the deal is because we'd be one of the few films with a diverse cast that everyone got their money back. So that argument, which is very often used against diverse casting or diverse subject matter, which is there isn't an audience for this. So if we can't see who the audience is, we're not going to get our money back. Therefore, we're not going to give you money. And I think we were super, super lucky that this coincided with things coming out in America that made money too. So... I think timing is a big part of it as well. Um, I, I am really optimistic about the future because unwittingly, because so many of our stories have not been allowed to be told up till now, we got millions of stories to tell. We don't, we don't, we're not barren of stories. We're not regurgitating the same things over and over again. We've got lots of new stuff. So for me, I feel really excited about what can be done now. That's good. Um, Raina, do you want to pick up on the fact that, you know, your film is based on a true story and, you know, deals with certain political issues, you could say. Do you want to discuss that and perhaps why you made that as a fiction versus documentary? So, it has a lot of themes in it, my film. Drugs and gun crime pregnancy and how your family 
and um, their points of view and their judgments that they have and project on you can sometimes damage you as you're growing up. Um, and everyone said, we don't want to see another film like this. We've had Bullet Boy, we've had Noel Clark's films. But I didn't care, I wanted to tell my story. And I thought it was different anyway, because um, it was based on the two central characters um, and their relationship. Um, and everyone who's seen it does never compares it to any of those films anyway. But I thought it was important. The, the, one of the reasons that I felt like I had to tell it was because the main character, he was dealing drugs but not because he was a bad person. It was almost like he didn't have any choice. And with his limitation of what was available to him, that's what he chose to get him to a better place. And I really wanted to express that, that sometimes people do bad things, but it's not because they're bad people. I needed to get that message across. Thanks. Nelly, um, so the recent films you showed as part of London Short Film Festival discuss sexual harassment, et cetera, et cetera. And in the set of films you've shown here, there's Girl Stalk that really looks at a kind of your age group and the kind of voice they have. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, sure. I, um, as she talks about in the film, um, <coughs> There's a lot of expectation is about what it means to be a woman, how to present yourself. Um, I think it sort of draws into a narrative in large in film that, you, like you were saying, that um, if there is a certain film out there, so it, it has to be like codified a certain way. You know, so if you have a, a film that has black people in it, it can't end well. It has to be about gangsters, and and you know, this is what we're all consuming. This is what we're all brought up with, and when you and so, whether you mean to or not, you, you conform to these guises and you never challenge them. So, um, we did a series of shorts that looked at um, sexual harassment. A lot of it was around catcalling, because I was interested in the fact that it's something that should seem very outmoded, outmoded or, um, or laughable. I've, you know, I've been catcalled lots of times in my life, but I've never seen it work. I've, yeah, I've never seen it. I've never seen anyone go like, "Oh yeah, actually." <laughs> How about it? But they carry on doing it, and you know, you know, you can't get aggressive at the guy because he'll get aggressive at you. So we showed a series of films that um, looked at catcalling and allowed different filmmakers to express it in different guises. Um, didn't necessarily have to be serious. So we had like a B movie horror where this, where these two girls get catcalled. And it sort of ends with them, you know, sort of ripping him to shreds, um, which obviously isn't like realistic. But it's, it's, you know, film has this ability to get express how you, how you're feeling inside, and and I don't know, use hyperbole to express that. Um, but we also had like Buzzfeed did a series of um, women catcalling men, which you know seems like a very simple trope. But again, it's something you never see in real life. And e even in the movie, like, you can't help but laugh at how sort of ridiculous and surreal it is. Um, but it also felt empowering for that reason. Or they had um, guys catcalling girls, but actually calling out um, that it's their own insecurities that are having them do this. Um, and yeah, it had a lot of positive response to it. Um, and yeah, I think it had a lot of people consider the fact that this is something that happens to them on a day to day, but they they never express it. I think being a woman, there's so many ways that you can be undermined for your gender um, that you just take by the by because you've you've never been told to take it any differently. I remember telling my dad like a year ago. I met him at a restaurant. I'd just been catcalled, and it was sort of this time of year, and I was wearing like a frumpy jumper. Uh, mm. um, and he was like, oh, you know, Nelly, you just can't dress sexually because, you know, men can't help themselves. And I was just sort of like, well, like, you know, even if I've been walking around in a bikini, that's, you know, I'd be freezing, but it'd be my rights. 
Like that. Like, why is that your reaction to what I've just told you? Yeah. It's, it, I think what it is is the cat calling because I know what that's feeling because not cat calling but I've walked at winter time long when I was younger in a long coat green coat and someone propositioned me so it's not it's it's I think with the cat calling I don't think a lot of women know how to deal with that in an empowering way and in in a in a positive way it's always I think in their mind, it's always a negative thing. Instead of them taking power over what he, what they say, when because uh, I've had it done, and it's like I just turn around and, and sort of I sort of laugh it off and sort of make them feel bad. But I think it's like knowing sometimes you can you can sort of laugh it off. And sometimes you can't, but sometimes you can laugh it off and it actually can be ne in a negative way. But I think it's the women don't know how to handle it so it doesn't get to them to those stages. And I would argue we haven't really got a way of dealing with it. You know, no one's ever given me an effective answer. Yeah, you, sometimes you can laugh it off, but sometimes the guy can then get aggressive at you mm. for laughing it off. Especially if there's yeah. a group. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. Um, and But you never see the reverse because we've come instilled with this idea that you know men can do this men can assert their authority that way um but but women can't and and if you know if women were to try and do the reverse um they would be considered ridiculous i wasn't gonna i wasn't gonna talk about the walk the whistling but since you're on the subject i think the point is women shouldn't have to feel any type of way because oh. you shouldn't have to you know, some ladies might like that, some might not. And if you're subjected to it and, and you're really, you might be feeling self-conscious about something. And I mean, it's happened to me. I feel really self-conscious. And then you know it's going to happen. You can feel it's coming. You're getting all tense. And then they do something. And then you have to think, what's my reaction today? Yeah, and you may not want to be agree. bothered. Do you know what I mean? Why should you have to walk yeah. down the street and then have to consider somebody else's feelings mm -hmm. about something that they've done when all you're doing is walking down Turning the street? Exactly. Ridiculous. Yeah. No, no, I don't. No. I don't agree with that. I'm not yeah. saying I'm not playing the victim. I'm just saying that if that's when that happens to me, and if I'm not in the mood for it, I'm going to be pissed off about it, and that's my right. I think the other point I was going to make, the other point I was going to make was just about what um, you were saying about seeing a black couple um, kiss on screen, like in a UK film not been seen and I, it, you've, it's really sad because I thought back and I thought the last time I saw a black couple stay together was Burning Illusion and look how long ago in UK and British that's film. film yeah yeah, yeah. and I was like you just said that and I just felt really sad about that because mm. that's like what what is the problem with seeing those films and the other point I was going to say was um it does seem like we're in a, in a renaissance there's a renaissance now of black filmmaking to have people of color not just black as well um people of colour, people of disabilities, LGBT, um, to have that cast in the scripts or on, on screen, how do we make sure that is um, sustained? How do we make sure, how do we hold commissioners accountable? Because at the moment, it's, there's a big thrust, there's a big mm -hmm. impetus. What happens in 10 years when... The it's a very good question, because I, I was just saying earlier that um, um, I was on holiday in, in LA visiting a friend who is a writer, and a lot of, and he's, he's like a white man writer. And he, he, um, he got an email from his agent saying, listen, we're just dealing with some stuff at the moment. We've got, you know, we've got Me Too going on. We've got the right, like the, the sort of interest in like um, minority writers. So we're going to just leave you for a year. Don't worry, we're still interested, but we'll be back. And then, and it was just like, and then I spoke to a couple of other people, and this is something that lots of agents have been sort of saying to their clients. It's just like, we have to park you, white male writer, because we've got to get these people through. And, um, and, and, and the fact that they put a date on when that's going to be over as well, <laughs> is like utterly terrifying. Get your proposals in quick. Yeah, utterly terrifying. <laughs> so I think there is um, potentially a problem. I think we are... Um, like 
according to the dates I was given, the middle of this year, things will start, maybe start coming apart again. Proposals get them in now, you're right. Um, but yeah, you're, there is a... There is something that needs to be done. I think, like, this little crack has sort of come open and a few people have been pulled through. And hopefully that we can keep those people there and they'll keep bringing people through. And I, think, and I hope that people are starting to see that not only are, is talent coming through, but there's, like, there's so many places that you can look for stories. There's so many places you can look for stories mm. now. And I think it's exciting and I'm hoping that the white people up top are like feeling the excitement of the of these new 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 voices, new blood coming through. There's a lot of pressure for change to happen and be sustained because um, I think there's been huge leaps made in casting in the last few years. You know, we see things on TV and in film now. I literally sit down and watch programs. I go two years ago, they would not have been cast. They would not, you just know, because you can tell by the names, also, you just know. But I think now I'm part of a small group of uh, filmmakers and TV programme makers who are, we're putting forward a proposal to government, whichever government will be in, for a new tax break. Because our thing is about, it's not just about in front of camera, it's about behind camera and who is telling those stories and who is making the programmes. And there was um, something, it was on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, because people say, oh, diversity, it's all sorted. It's all, don't worry about it, we're, we're getting there. And there's a programme on the BBC, um, which is that dance programme, uh, best dancer in the world or something, mm. I don't know. And it's got four presenters, and three of them there are either female or black. So they've got a very diverse in front of camera. And then there was put on Twitter a snapshot of the crew. And there's about 80 people in the crew, not one person of colour. So they're still... Let's not be fooled and lulled into kind of thinking it's all OK. There's still a lot of work to be done. There are some people who are really working hard to make it happen. Not everybody who makes programmes is a baddie. It's not like they're going, we don't want black people to work on it, we don't want women to shoot it. There is um, a complacency, and that's why we think, you know, quite often money talks, because we've all been talking for a long time about women directors, women DOP, black people. We've been talking till the cows come home. And the, the horrific figures, and the reason I got involved in this new campaign is because 18 years when the diversity network was set up between different television companies, they worked out that behind the scenes, about 3% of crew were black. 18 years later, what's the percentage? 3%. So after all the talk and all the diversity schemes, blah, 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 not much has changed. So that's why we think a carrot of money will hopefully work. I'm, it's something I'm always uh, really scared that diversity is this sort of fad for the year because mm, I was mm. at a party, a New Year's party for 2018 and this guy came up to me and he was, he was like, oh, I know what the trends are this year. He was like, Korean boy fashion, diversity, diversity is going to be really in this year. And I just sat there being like, how could you claim that to be a fad? You know, something that you can like put on your magazines this year and then be done with. But I think there is a real fear of that, um, and there's no straightforward answer to it. You know, we've been talking about it all, all this year. We're talking about generations, and even within itself, you know, you get um, black filmmakers or writers who get annoyed that the only time they get invited to a festival is to be on a diversity panel. So that can be an issue mm -hmm. in itself. Um, but so I, many diversity. So chat. many diversity panels. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I really quickly wanted to editorialise and say I am very optimistic because um, someone up there said money talks, I think data talks, and the reason why um, there is, like, things have gone really well, people wanted Black Panther, and when it came along, finally, it's one of the biggest gracing films of, of last year, um, and when, I'm, when I say data talks, people... Um, commission to their or, or program to their prejudices so if white men hold 
the keys. They're like, oh, we've al allowed enough people in. We've allowed them to see themselves. Whereas if you're Netflix and you just look at 40 million households watched um, Sex Education, which is the most colourful and diverse show mm. ever, in less, it came out on January 11th. They're like, yeah, fine, here, <laughs> more black people because data talks. Um, and if you give people stuff, they'll make it. So I'm I'm optimistic because now that instead of going by what's worked before people are going by what are people do what's their appetite um and on the back of that i listen to lots of podcasts one of which is um don't at me by justin simeon who um created dear white people the film and then the tv show on netflix he interviewed both ava duvernay and Issa ray and they were very candid talking about how they feel about the industry and all the rest of it and they are very clear about creating communities because once this fad, as as you say, once the time is up on, you know, we've allowed enough black people in, um, they will, uh, they, they want to have created outside of that one pathway a strong enough foundation that they can create their own work. I am, because we don't have as a buoyant a film industry in the UK, We'd, and you know you had to go to New York to learn and all the rest of it. I'm wondering how is it that we can do the same? Stop asking for permission. Stop having to apply to divert. Which I hate the word diversity. It should be inclusion because if you keep calling people different, they will remain different. It's inclusive um, instead of begging to be part of uh, you know getting uh, money to to solve people's guilt. How can we just stop asking permission from them and collectively? talk to people who only care that you make good content oh, your amazons your netflix so yeah how can we how can we organize um i forget who was it dark your your mum talking to stokely carmichael oh yeah yeah like um and he was glad that they were organizing yeah. i wonder if that's one thing that but our this generation is, we've, sees we've, like i think we've, we've talked about this it's like, it's about it's about finding your finding your crew and making the work and and, and then putting like if as long as the work is there It'll get seen, and you keep building your networks around it, like from like from like zero, from like no money. If you have your if you have your team of people, just make the content, keep making the content, and you will you will be found because there are like net, Netflix. Half the work is like finding mm -hmm. the thing. What's the new thing? Mm -hmm. It's like half of like trying to get into to TV is like having ideas. So if like if you've got ideas, they're looking for you. And right now, I might, but like this is pretty broad for say, but if you are of colour and you have ideas, they are going to be looking for you right now. Until for six months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, t I have a slightly optimistic take on the six months deadline because it feels like we've started a wave and a woman says data counts and you have, you know, let's use. Um, Black Panther as something uh, of a political kind of film because it's it's brought in so many numbers. It means that well, can we can they turn back on that? That's a question. Can they kind of go back to pre Black Panther when Black Panther did so well? Yeah. Um, and so in that sense, it feels you know I'm just a bit more optimistic um, in terms of kind of distribution in terms of you know what we're we've been talking about in terms of content um so this is me just trying to wrap up and ask for a kind of final comment from you guys um in terms of content um it'd be interesting to um hear what you think we should you know so you mentioned ideas what sort of films we should be expecting in the next 10 years or so um or what the type of films you ideas you have already developing perhaps um if you could talk a little bit about that i mean i can certainly speak about my projects and so um i'm developing the clip you saw was a work in progress um regions and vicky and um also there's a film that's in the pop-up cinema um short film um titled invisible woman 2.0 um which is about migrant um women young women um and their struggles to survive in terms of, you know, coming from far-flung places. Um, and, um, yeah, I just, I, you know, and I have other ideas that I'm developing. Um, 
but certainly looking at socially uh, relevant issues. Um, uh, so that's me. Um, Reina, do you want to comment, final comments on what you're working on? And yeah, I have a bunch of project. scripts, um, mainly to do with women trying to almost like transitioning through life. Um, I write them as drama, but they turn out to be comedy. So that's what I, that's the theme, women. Women and struggle. Um, I'm working on an eight part audio series at the moment. Um, and I'm making a um, half hour separately, half hour audio documentary, which is the spin off of the film that. Um, I just played, um, which is about being a shit activist in a time <laughs> where we need to be better activists, frankly, because everything's falling apart. Um, so yeah, so that's what I, that's what I'm doing at the moment. And um, but yeah, I also I also wanted to say I am I am optimistic. It's just the it's the cynical Hollywood um, writers agents that are, are less optimistic. Um, but yeah, yeah. That's um, well, I'm not a filmmaker, obviously, so I can't, you know, butt in on this part. But I'm really excited to show what you guys want to be making, and Ooh. you know, <laughs> yeah, and just to put on a, an array of a content that hopefully represents more people and speaks to more people. Um, I'm working with a number of writers. I suppose my slate's about 80% TV, 20% film, for very practical reasons. Um, um, I'd say 60% of the writers I'm working with, probably 70 are women. Um, I'm very excited to be able to get stories out there that are about the female experience, but in many different ways. So we've got a comedy, I'm looking for some genre pieces, uh, we've got a historical thriller. So they really do run the gamut of storytelling, and I think um, I just try not to limit what I work on. Um, there's very few things I'd say definitely no, but that's down to my personal taste. But I do feel very excited about what's to come. I am very optimistic, because I think all of the old rules have kind of been thrown out the window in the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. So that makes me really happy, and it means that the conversations I have with financiers now are the polar opposite two conversations I had not that very long ago. And for things to change so quickly is really quite amazing. And I think if anyone's got stories that, to me, they're not that radical. They're just about the world that I see when I walk down the road. And it, it sort of comes as a surprise to me that to some other people, that in itself is really quite shocking. But I think that says more about them than it does about me. And that's it, guys. Thanks for coming out. <laughs> Thank you.